constructive criticism, and that they develop an awareness of the affective power of art. The students do this in my class through learning about visual communication and creating a two-dimensional poster and a three-dimensional object or toy towards supporting their personal campaign to affect change. The specific technology goals I had were to increase or improve students' engagement with the unit, um, to put connectivism into the unit, to broaden the opportunities for differentiation, and to take the project-based learning aspect of the unit into literally a third dimension. My toolbox at the beginning was very full. Um, I tried all of these things to varying degrees of success. These were the four tools that helped me to reach those goals to some degree. PowerPoint, which I'll talk about in a moment, about the introduction. Creatables is an online art social website for children where they can post work and comment on it. Audioboo is an app where students can give feedback orally and share it digitally. And Tinkercad is an online computer-aided design program that students can create objects and then print them on a 3D printer. The provocation was inspired uh, by the Adrian Cam workshop. I took his idea of a digitally interactive story and created a digitally interactive sort of treasure hunt game. The students worked in pairs um, on their laptops and stepped through a series of screens to do activities, to do a bit of research, and to engage with me and with visuals to show their understanding of the principles of design, which in this case were contrast and unity and balance. The students' overall um, reaction, I think, was mixed. Um, Specifically with the, the provocation I just mentioned, the introduction, on this Google Doc, students gave me feedback. I got some positive feedback about what they did like about it, things they think I should do differently next year, which is very helpful to me. And then lastly, how the, the game, the digital game, helped them to learn about those principles of design. The Creatables website, the students loved because they felt it was sort of like Facebook, which they can't access. They got a chance to, to like each other, to follow each other. And some students did get some good feedback which helped them on the posters. Thank you for all the people commenting. Um, my name is Using audio boo was also popular because students love doing pretty much anything on an iPad, I find. Uh, so that that was a that was a popular tool for them to use. And lastly, although many students didn't get to it, they were totally fascinated by the idea of creating something in three dimensions on a screen, on, a, on an online program, then getting to print it on the school's 3D printer, which most of them were totally unaware of, uh, to create this sort of tool or toy, uh, sorry, this toy or object which was supporting their campaign, in this case fitness, and, and improving one's health. I think the evidence, um, like the learning, was, was mixed. Uh, there are varying degrees of it. This is from about midway through the unit. So, so um, I like it because um, it's um, it's interactive. Yeah. Um, I like it because it's not it's not busy. It's, it's not very busy. Easy to understand. To so what's that called? Is that those straight lines? Is that contrast, unity, or balance? Balance. Right. Responding to the central idea of the unit. Yes, I will. I think it can, but it depends how you also uh, inform people about this media. So, can you give an example? Um, like if, uh, if there's a poster that says, stop animal scanning, there's nothing really anyone can do about that. But if it's like something like that says, like, drop the pump from a shelter, you kind of tell anyone how to do it. Using the audio boot app to critique. My name is Harry. I made a campaign poster about saving electricity. I created contrast by putting black letters in front of yellow and light gray. I created unity by using a few colors and using the same fonts. I created balance by drawing the letters the same size. My design is successful because I have contrast, unity, and balance. One thing I would change is color the yellow meter. And responding to one of the learning outcomes. I think art has a point of power because it could make the walls and feel sad for 
And then lastly, a couple examples of the posters themselves. On the left, from the very beginning of the unit, the first rough draft, and then two months later, after the peer critique, the creatables critique, and a lot of uh, elbow grease, I guess, in the final design. This is uh, from a girl, and this is from one of the boys. <laughs> 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 Well, upon reflection, personally, this was a totally transformative unit um, for me. Um, looking at the specific goals I had, uh, student engagement, the, the Adrian Cam inspired game was, was brilliant. I realized I can use this in any unit, and the kids were just so eager to do the game each time they came back. It took three classes. I thought it would take one. There was a bottleneck, though, when they had to come talk to me and interact and move to the next stage. It caused students to have to wait in line a little bit, so I need to solve that problem. Connectivism, using creatables. They love being on creatables. The site, however, is very new. It started in January, so there are not very many users as of yet. Most of the comments, it turns out, came from adults, probably art teachers, um, but I'm hoping in a year's time that the, the site is growing, uh, so I hope in a year's time that, that problem will go away. Differentiation, interestingly, most students didn't choose to make their posters digitally, which I thought they would. Only two out of about 45 students did. But on the responding strand, doing the critiques, they all wanted to use the Audioboo app. They preferred that as opposed to just writing in pencil and paper. And project-based learning, again, they all wanted to get on Tinkercad to do the 3D design and then to print on the printer and then to either paint or, or do something with these little, little uh, toys they created. But most students didn't, uh, did not get to that stage. I let the, I didn't manage the time well enough for them all to finish their poster in time to get to that stage. So overall, I think the unit was, it was a bit much. I did too much. The children were at times scattered <clears throat> and a bit inconsistent in what they were doing. So it's, it's going to take some tweaking on my part to, to improve it. Sharing, I, I, I think I can share it at a faculty meeting. We have a monthly after school PD um, tech sessions that I can present at. I'm part of the Facebook page, which was developed from the art teachers who are on the Creatable site currently, so I can share with teachers in other schools. Um, I have my, my classroom blogs, of course, and I'm part of a couple of art educators' forums um, that I can share, share this with as well. So my big takeaways, um, maybe not surprisingly, is really the need to take risks to really look at some of my units and upend them and to try new things, try new tools in a really uh, substantive way. Um, it's proven to me, this unit, that, that, that I think it does improve student learning. <laughs> And then, no surprise, again, I've, I think I've known this since my first year, but if I don't present things in a way that children are interested in, and if I don't try a lot of things to see which ones work, um, I think I'm not fulfilling the, the potential that, that's there. For me, the whole unit was, it was all an enhancement over what I did last year. It was, for me, pers personally transformative. Um, technically speaking, I think that the way I integrated technology probably reached the level of modification. They were definitely significant task redesigns. Um, I think with Creatables, with the Adrian Cam inspired game, uh, and with Tinkercad, I'm going to have to put more work into it to get it to a stage of, of redefinition. But um, overall, um, it was a transformative uh, experience for me. I have the clicker and the remote for it, and it wants to use it. Well, I'll just leave it here. But I think you may have to plug it in and tap your keyboard or something to get it to work. Yeah, it should work pretty quickly. If you leave it there, it should be. It, okay, it, it, yeah. It did work quickly. Thank so you, I'll Aaron. And there's batteries. You want to take a moment to complete your survey? Aaron, you did that with 25 seconds to spare. Nicely done. You're out. When 10 minutes comes, that's it.
People good with the survey? Can I start the timer again? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, Marilyn. Oh, come on. Okay. On your mask, get set. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> um, so I looked at using Google Plus for um, my classroom uh, for my project this year, and I teach IB chemistry in grade eleven and twelve, and it can be very, very frustrating because it's incredibly content heavy. I have, I think, <laughs> twenty-two. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, right? <laughs> so it's frustrating for two reasons. One, because all the students think that I'm going to teach them how to make drugs. But another <laughs> reason, because um, I have so much material to get through in such a short space of time. Two years, but 22 topics to cover for a higher level in two years. At the end of it, they have an exam which is worth 76% of their grade. So. It means I need to go fairly fast, and I end up being a bit like this guy from uh, Ferris Bueller, and I tend to be standing at the front of the classroom doing a, a lot of lecture style, whereas in my NYP classes, it's completely different. and We're all just bumbling along, and I'm learning with the students, and the pace is better, and I'm, but with the DP, I really sacrifice, I think, um, a lot of student understanding just because I need to go as fast as I can. So I... After about oh, three courses of Kotal, and it was maybe October last year, and I thought, okay, I think I can fix this up. I'm going to try and redefine my classroom a little bit. And I had a little around, uh, look around for some tools, and in the end, I decided on uh, Google Plus to use. And my aim here was to try and take the onus a little bit off me and let go a little bit and try and get the students to not be replying so much on everything that was coming out of my mouth and be able to learn a little bit more independently and find solve things for themselves and connect with the wider world and other chemistry students and other, other uh, uh, schools and other experts in chemistry as well. Um, and I thought that Google Plus would be a good forum for this because Although I knew they used Facebook and things like this, this was kind of new, so it's kind of a fresh start for them. And they use Facebook really for socialising a lot, and I wanted them to be using this for for um, school. Um, also, I like the whole Google Hangouts thing in there. So what I did is I created a two communities, which was a mistake already. I should have just created one for both grade 11 and 12, but I did two separate ones. And um, this is the grade 11 community. I like, it looks like Facebook, so it's kind of uh, familiar for them. Up in the top right corner, you can put permanent links. So my blog, my classroom blog was permanently linked there because I had been putting resources to share with them up on there. The problem with the blog is they can't put resources up there, but now they can. So I put some stuff up there, but also if we scroll down, there's lots of things from there that they've shared as well that they've found. The other great thing about this for sharing is that on the left-hand side here, you can put all kinds of categories. So here we have a bunch of topics that we've studied. So you can click one. I want to find that resource from bonding, and then all the bonding stuff comes up. So it's all collect it's much easier to find than scrolling through millions of uh, um, emails. So, after using it for the last six months or so, I surveyed them to see how they were actually going with the, with the whole thing. Um, and I found some interesting stuff. First of all, they did like using the community. They used a lot of tools for study, but they were at the community all the time. And I think that's because I was posting stuff on there that they needed, and also I actively made them use it by making them, requiring them to post things for certain activities and stuff. So I asked them about sharing resources and they really like using Google for sharing resources from me to them and also between each other. They also still like it when I share it or when they get it by email. But I think that's because a lot of them didn't realise that they could set their notifications so they got an email. Um, when something new was posted on the on the community. This was the thing that was the problem. This is why it was kind of a bit of a failure from what my original plan was to try and get them learning more independently. 
they didn't use it to communicate with anyone. They didn't look for other resources um, and discuss them or go to uh, forums or things like this. They used Facebook and Skype, but mainly that's just talking to each other in the evening, not talking to people in the wider community. So just to quickly hear from them themselves what they said about how they use technology and chemistry. Oh, why is there no sound? Is your sound plugged in? Sound is plugged in. Yeah, trying to promote your session, I guess. Oh, it's all right. I had the volume down. I'm not <laughs> sure why. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, no. Why is it not working? <laughs> Take two. <team. laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. It takes a second. What tools do you use to study the chemistry? I don't think I have a textbook and a syllabus. Good. I use the first one. Well, I use IBCAM. I use. Is it a website? The website. Mm -hmm. And then Richard Thorne's YouTube videos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I use Google Plus, <laughs> where we put past papers on there. I use Google Plus as well, but I asked my friend Kay, who's really smart, so tells me a lot of good answers for the questions. Uh, um, YouTube. Oh, Quizlet. Quizlet. Yeah, Quizlet. On the net. And IV chemistry, IV bioenergy. Past papers. Past papers. Yeah. Um, uh, you Google Plus. Yeah. Yeah. What do you use that for? To share. Share answers. Answer. Past papers. Resources. Uh, YouTube videos. And if you're studying and you can't find the answer to something, what do you do? Ask you. <laughs> I'm not there. I'm not in there. I go to the Ivy Chem website for the chemistry one. It depends. Sometimes we use Skype or something. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, we sometimes meet up at school and study Skype. Skype. Oh, Facebook oh, sometimes. Oh, no, no, like, like, it's my old people oh, oh, outside oh, my ears. Oh, so, oh, it's like yes. catching on. No, I don't do that. Oh, I do. What do you think the best way is for teachers to share resources with you? Email. Yeah. Email. Google Plus. Google yeah, Plus. Those two. Yeah. I wish Google Plus so gave us more notification. Yeah, but Google Plus, it's like a Facebook tag. I can look back. That's true, right? And then with email, you have to then go through all your emails. Both. Mm -hmm. I like to go to plus settings. Everything's there. You don't need it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you got to see what I like to post. I use uh, the Google Plus forum that we have that you have created for us. And I also use, once in a while, the shared documents that you have shared with us on Google Drive. So everything comes from me? Yes. You don't look out that's, that's elsewhere for other things? But really, you guys are you sure? I could be lying. It's a big risk you take. So then, so I failed in that many ways because they still really rely on me. And I think that um, what I have to do is try and separate myself a little bit more and let go a little bit more. <sighs> Um, because they're still very reliant on me. I need to let them, I need to not answer their questions so much. So the Google Plus, I think, worked well for sharing. It works that well. And the service of an atheist. This message is sponsored by the Neo Atheist. God's dead, the movie sucks, and this message to Christians can blow it out the asshole.
Have a nice night. Yeah. You're muted. Hi, Kim. Hi. How many seconds? You're, You're muted again, Kim. Kim, you, you need to unmute yourself. Hi. I think I'm muting when you're talking, so maybe let us talk. Why? Sorry, I couldn't catch up. Can I just ask, I have this limited camera here, please stand in this area where you can see yourself on the camera because really your presentations are great and you're going to want the video recording of this for later. You can use it for recruiting, you can use it and remix it for something else, like it's a really good example of the work that you've done. So please, I know the light isn't so great and it's just a computer camera, but please try to stand where you can see yourself in the camera here. Um, We'll do our best. <laughs> you turn around to look at your slide, you mean? Wow. How about turning the podium so you guys all want to stand behind the podium after all that presentations and work we did. I'm feeling a failure right now. <laughs> you could also get someone to do be your clicker if you can't use a clicker. If you need to stand back there, you should stand back there. All right. All right, Bethany, I'm starting your timer. Hold on one sec. Ready? I'm ready. Go. Oh, oh. All right. Guys, Bethany's 10 minutes have started. All right. I, I have to start with a confession. This project isn't as far along as I really wanted it to be. And I think as you see it, you'll, you'll understand why. Um, so there's some of the things on the survey that would be difficult to fill out. But um, last week at this time, I thought I would stand up here right now, open my mouth, and cry like a two-year-old. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> We actually we had some really some really good breakthroughs this week that means that it um, that it's going to continue. So I'm going to, I'm kind of giving like the midstream report, and um, I'll try to explain um, what that is. So first of all, how many of you have a student tech team at your school? Okay, so just the YIS people. Oh, yes. All right. So um, we don't have one at Sacred Heart. And so I devoted um, my project to figuring out whether or not to change that. And um, this ends up being a tale of two surveys and a modest proposal. I'll let you know where that is at the end. So I started my research by trying to figure out who's doing this really well, why IS is doing it really well. Um, I also found um, the Burlington High School Help Desk, which is in Burlington, Massachusetts. And they have an amazing program for their high schoolers. And this is their, web, their website. And um, they operate as a class and as a face-to-face -face help center. And they also post online resources for students, for teachers. Um, for parents, and also for more and more, and more I think they're becoming
becoming a resource for everyone in the world. And they create media um, that is worth looking at, let's see, the Help Desk Media, and one of their most recent um, Help Desk Live episodes, let's see if it will load, is a, um, tech, they do tech talks, I'm not sure if I'm going to, okay, they talk about, actually talk about tech teams. And so this is a, this episode 9 that was just posted on April 4th. Um, they have a conversation, their help desk has a conversation with another help desk and they talk about their role in the school. So what I needed to do was figure out what kind of role um, a, a help desk or a student run tech center would have at our school in Sacred Heart. And so what I ended up, uh, ha ended up happening for me is that I became Um, I wanted to know if we could use this space as a help desk center, um, if we could open it at lunchtime, if we could have student experts in there giving face-to-face -face help to our students and maybe even to our teachers, the way the help desks that I was looking at online were doing. And so I ended up interning in the IT department. And so these were basically my project partners, Christian, Craig, and Ken. And some of you might know them. And so um, along the way, they were my supporters and mentors, fellow survey composers, fellow proposal writers. Um, last week when I thought it was all over, they, they said it's not all over yet. <laughs> so, all right. So the first thing that we needed to do was to figure out um, whether or not students needed face-to-face -face support. So we put together a survey of um, 202 middle school and high school students. And one of the most interesting results um, was the answer to this question. What's the best way for you to learn new technologies? And we found that 114 chose that, 114 selected, I learn best when someone shows me how and explains as one of the best ways that they learn new technologies. So I felt that one, this was very validating for an old middle aged person like myself because that's one of the ways that I <laughs> learn new technologies, probably more than the other ways. And it's also validating as an old middle-aged teacher because usually I expect myself if I'm going to use a new tool to be able to actually show my students how to use it. Um, so this was one of the reasons we felt that maybe looking at a tech team and, and putting it into our school would be helpful for our students if having someone show them how to use new technology and explain it um, is what they need. So, I'll tell you a secret. My administrators were surprised by the answer to this question. So, and I'll short poll, how many of you have asked your students to show each other how to do something on the computer? Yeah, I was surprised by their surprise, <laughs> because I do it all the time. Um, but it was also helpful, the, the student survey was also helpful for figuring out that the largest organic source of tech help that students currently have at Sacred Heart are other students. And so that also helped to justify why we could consider putting in a student-run tech team um, program at our school. So I wanted to get more specific about the kinds of things they were asking each other for help with. So I, one of the uh, survey questions asked them, um, what's an example of something that you have asked your friends or classmates to help you to use? And then I took the answers and I made it into this impressionistic word art. Um, I used Word It Out, which have, if you haven't used that, I have to recommend it. It doesn't have as many JavaScript problems as Wordle does. And I found that the range, while it didn't surprise me, um, I thought it was interesting that when I asked the next question, which was, what is something you help someone else do? The answers were actually broader. So, so I wondered if their memory was better if they helped someone else than if they had asked for help. <laughs> Anyway, what this showed us was that, um, that students' tech needs were highly individual and highly problem specific, which is not necessarily surprising, but when you're going to try to convince people that this is something that we should consider adding to our school, you had to explain why it didn't need to just be a class or just necessarily integrated into the classroom, but something that, um, that needed to be added as a program that could give face-to-face -face support to individual students. Okay, so 
Unfortunately, the next um, answer really disappointed me because I asked if we had a center at lunchtime, would you go? And only eight said yes. <laughs> so anyway, then I thought I had these visions of, of this empty room that's empty like it is now, except now it would have two sad students waiting to help students. <laughs> down. So um, I looked through all of the other responses and realized those were actually more specific forms of yes. And so then I realized I probably should have added a yes, I would go if I had a specific problem or a specific need. And then I think that would have been better for the results of this survey. But I thought all um, hope is not lost because we have 80 students that would go to a tech center if their teachers recommended it. So now we needed to find out if teachers would actually want this or recommend it. So we then put together a survey for the teachers, many of whom sit here, and thank you for answering the survey. So um, we uh, asked our teachers if they would refer students for help if we had oh, two minutes. And we found that um, many of them were quite open to the idea. And then this was corroborated by another question, which um, showed that most people were quite open. We didn't have any opposition. We didn't have anyone, which what I thought would happen is someone would say, we don't need this. We don't need to add another thing to our program. Students don't learn this way, and I can help them in the classroom. So, um, but we found that most thought it was a worth, worth considering, and this was probably our most encouraging answer. We asked teachers if, if we added additional support, a like student-run tech center during the school day, would that influence the way they were integrating technology? We had 10 teachers that said it would either change the range of technology, or it might change the range of technologies that they were using, or it would change how often they integrated technology into their instruction. 10 teachers in a small school is a lot. And so um, we thought that that was um, hopefully very convincing for our administrators. So our final pressing question is, would we have enough students who would be willing to volunteer in a student-run tech center? And we found 27 that said yes, which I thought was a great number. Um, and we also found 76 that said maybe if we had some training. And so we've been looking at what training we might use. There are some things out there. I will blog about them. So. Um, so we knew that we had students that were interested, so I had to take a closer look at who they were. I found something very interesting. The students that wanted to, that said, yes, I like helping others with technology, generally had no fewer than two uh, ways that they learned technology. Many of them selected all four. I learned technology all four of these ways. So then I compared them to the bottom group that said that, yes, I need this to catch up with my classmates. And I found the opposite. They had one way that they learned best, which is when someone shows me how and explains. And so I thought that was an interesting match between our students that were ready to volunteer and our students that were ready to, to look for help. All right, that's okay. 10 minutes. All right, so stay tuned to my blog and I'll let you <laughs> know whether or not we'll have a help desk in 2014-15. We would like to open um, in this space daily from 12.30 to 1, and we would like to have an online space on Moodle that's open 24 hours. All right, thank you.
Are we ready? We still need another minute for the survey. You guys are doing an awesome job, by the way, of knowing when you go and just coming up and doing it. I wish my classroom was like this. <laughs> so smooth. <laughs> Not like, wait, it's my turn. Can I start? Yeah. Claire. Go. OK, so my final co-shell project, I wanted to do something that was going to help us with the Grade 5 PYP exhibition, um, which started a few weeks ago. So I was looking at something to, like a forum for the students, and um, particularly Unibus, um, we're looking at heritage, where we are in time and place. In the past, I haven't really uh, embraced the idea of a flipped classroom, but I thought this is the time to give it a go. Um, allow for more meaningful discussion online. Apparently, it's a good differentiation tool and um, drives new thinking, so I thought I'll give this a go. And so my goal was to have the students collaborate online to discuss any of the IB or PYP essential elements and decide on a topic of interest to them. Make that a little bit easier, which is usually done in class uh, with great angst and lots, lots of time. So the standards that I was looking at was collaborating with peers, um, posing significant questions, um, identifying problems and using the technology to drive learning. Okay. How would we do this? No? What would be the best way? What would be user friendly for us? So I came up with the idea of some sort of forum, some sort of blog that they could uh, write their ideas on during the week um, or a couple of weeks and then come to class and we'll have the discussion. So there would be preparation going on there and hopefully that would flip the classroom. So I discussed it with my teaching partner and we decided to embed, embed simple Google Docs into our exhibition site that we run every year. So the next week we uh, introduced the idea to the students and they were encouraged to write the ideas that they had during over the winter break on there. So we started to get these topics going. We reminded them um, to keep going and when they saw their ideas up on the screen then it motivated them to add to the comments and it reminded that the target audience was them. So they were helping the class to decide on things. We reviewed the top forum with the students by looking at the common themes that they had been talking about. We're trying to find topics for the heritage. At that stage, we came up with 22 possible topics. We put that aside for a while while we just started to look at some of the other IB elements that we wanted to look at. Once again, they looked at and commented during the week. And at the end of the week, we, they came together and you know uh, did a little task to see how would they define the profiles and how would they be knowledgeable in the exhibition. So it was all preparation for the exhibition. <clears throat> we decided to start grouping the topics in some way. What was the issue? What was the concept involved? What were their interests? What were their choices? And we had added to them. So now we had 27 topics. So we had to make sense of it in some way. So we encourage them to keep looking at the topics, to move their names around, to uh, look at the ideas that the others have had. And we went into some heavy negotiation because kids weren't all going to get their first <laughs> choice, right? They're going to second or third choice. So finally on the 13th of February, we thought we were there. We thought it was great. And in fact, we were there on this one. We identified 10 groups. And seeing them online, it allowed us to group them a uh, little bit with some, a leader possibly in each group and a group that needed a lot of support. So we interviewed every uh, group and to our absolute delight, they seemed quite happy with the topic that they ended up with. Ours are always collaborative in, in groups of three or four. We then took this aside while we looked at some of the other uh, IB uh, elements that we wanted to look at before the exhibition started. They wrote what they thought about international mindedness, 
we put the whole Google Doc into a Wordle, came up, they could see the words that were really uh, coming up all the time, so we wrote a class definition. We were really proud of this because we shared it with the staff who had also been doing some PD on international mindedness. Then we started looking at the skills, uh, yes, thinking and research, but how were they going to use uh, social um, communication and self-management skills during the exhibition, so all of these ideas were going up. Next we looked at PYP attitudes, once again they wrote during the week and at the end of the week we did a class activity where they had to identify the attitudes that might go with each picture and they used the attitudes and the learner profile to write um, essential agreements for their exhibition group. So this was sort of mid-March at this stage. The last two weeks were spent looking at the PYP concepts. Uh, they wrote once again on the, on the collaborative Google Doc during the week and then they identified big questions to do with their particular topic and which led to the three questions, and guided questions, which then turned into their lines of inquiry and uh, developing their central ideas. So it was quite a long process. I'd have to admit this really wasn't done until after the spring break. Did I meet the goals? I think I did meet the goals of flipping the classroom. I was really, really happy with the way that the topics were chosen by, you know, talking about lots of things over those five to six weeks. Um, do I think I should have done all of the IB elements as well? I'm not sure. Maybe that muddied the waters. Maybe it was too long because uh, it went on for nearly three months, basically. Uh, maybe it took it out too long. And, and another thing is that they have their own individual Google sites, but they have their commenting is sort of haphazard, you know, great job, you know, Coco or whatever. <laughs> and I think we need to teach them to blog earlier. Our kids aren't really blogging or commenting in a meaningful way. So I think that would be something that I'd really need to do next time. But did I flip the classroom? I think it really uh, it showed me that it works better than I've given it credit for. Julie was right all along. <laughs> and I think it did promote peer interaction and collaboration and also um, a higher student engagement because some kids just love this. Once they, you know, if they if they like the topic, then they embrace the technology and really run with it. So it gave me the impetus to try a lot more. How did the students feel? I, I was really happy with their responses. Most of them thought that it was great that, that they liked doing this. I mean, any excuse to get on their computer at night and say, "Mum and Dad's homework is great," and uh, but their responses were good, and I felt they actually said most of them said it helped them to choose a topic. And so that was good. And that gave me evidence that, um, that they actually learned something from it. And particularly now that they're working in the exhibition, I can see that coming through. So how did they feel? I liked it because it, it really reminded me of like PYP and the element was fun for me because I got to see other people's point of view and I got to comment on their point of view and their opinion and, and reply to their comments and reply. So I, so I like replying to other people's comments because it's about their opinion. Okay. Do you think it helped you make up your mind about what you were going to do? Yes. And so did you like the idea that we um, we put that up there first and then we discussed it in class. Is that a, a uh, good aspect? Yeah, because then uh, you can see, like, then you first you can talk about it and then you can talk about it in class. It makes it uh, much easier because then you're prepared. I thought it was a really good idea because they used, it drugged our brains and we got us into the right thinking area for like, before the exhibition so that. Um, it wasn't just something in the background, it was something that we were concentrating on all through all through the time, not only before but also during exhibition. Um, maybe a better way to do it might or might have been instead of writing it under, you could have had, you could have covered it on the side as you can do it on the cover. Okay, so Okay, um, obviously uh, the teaching partner and I were working with it and the PYP coordinator and all the teachers that were dealing with grade five. I've shared it on this site and I'm really interested now, I'm asking a lot more teachers, how do you choose 
topics for your exhibition. Right, so I do think that for that project, flipping the classroom worked really well. Um, my aha moment for this particular course is that online collaboration can, uh, is far more powerful and easier than I thought. I still think it can be overwhelming to start with and uh, time consuming, but the, what you achieve is far greater than all of us working individually, so that's great. Um, do I think it, where do I think it got to? I think it was a modification of a task. However, it was a task done much better and I think uh, the technology was inconceivable the way I did it without the technology. So I think it did redefine it for me. It flipped the classroom. It allowed them to time to think and understand and come to class really well prepared. Um, so I think it really transformed their learning and my learning. I think it, it just did a much better job than if we had. So maybe somewhere between the two. But I found it really, really useful. Um, preparation for the exhibition. I realize I'm doing a crappy job of warning people at the two to three minute mark. Would anyone like to take that responsibility on? Yay! Thanks, Sally. So does it do itself? Yeah. So it I just turn it to ten, and then it times itself. It counts down, and then it'll give a little beep, gentle beep. Okay. Yes. Yes. Can we do a quick show of hands of who wants the vegetarian option for lunch today? Uh, let me see how many hands. Raise your hands. I said one, two, three, four. It's calzones. You didn't read my email. The most important part. Uh, I think we can do yours if you want. So I, I counted seven. Was I right? Wait, one more time. And then me. Am I seven too? Yes. Can you go downstairs and tell them we have 23 people, six vegetarian, one vegan? Is that okay? Yeah. Thanks, Marilyn. Okay, so I don't need to worry about this anymore. That's good. So this just starts by itself, Allie? Just when I move it to 10, it just goes? Yeah, just put it on to 10, and then it will count down. Cool. Maybe do your timer at the same time. Off. Okay. You ready, Mary? Go. Go. Okay, good morning. My Ooh. final project involves grade 10 EAP, English for Academic Purposes. All throughout the year, we were actually building on their argumentation skills using ethos, pathos, and logos. So, and their goal this time is actually to take a stance on an issue of contention, and then they have to give compelling evidence. The standard for this also overlap with uh, technology, which means research and information fluency. That means locating information using digital tools from different sources and weighing that, evaluating it, processing it, and reporting it using ethical means. So the hot topic at that time was marijuana and the legalization of it in the states for recreational purpose. I thought that would be great to actually use as, as a topic. My biggest challenge, oops, my biggest challenge was that, um, sorry, it actually um, had a lot of, like the internet had so much resources that were looking really good and credible on the surface, but underneath it was very biased. So I was really, really worried that the kids would latch on a view and then run with it. So to introduce a topic, I brainstormed with them, and then this is what they thought. So now I'm going, OK, so which one do I do? I should contain it first. I have to actually show uh, models of good balanced sources. So I shared with them a Google Doc. They made a copy. They shared it back with me. All the resources were put in the box. The idea is actually to collect the notes using the resources that I shared with them. The first thing I noticed with the articles that I read 
most of the articles would say marijuana affects the brain, like it's assumed knowledge. So I thought, let's start with the scientific angle. So I actually asked them, let's watch a video, take notes of what it's saying. I chose ASP Science because it, uh, the language was accessible and the visuals were helpful. Uh, additionally, I felt it also had subtitles. So for my class, that was really easy to understand. Okay, when they started taking notes, one thing I noticed was that they often zoomed in on visual information, and mostly on information that confirmed their preconceptions. They would write, relaxed, high, or euphoria. I'm going, guys, you're not listening. You're not listening to what the speaker is saying. You need to think. Talk about the scientific angle. How does marijuana affect the brain? So you need to use scientific terms. And once we did that, I could check their Google Docs and see if they're on track. If they weren't on track, I could give them a no. So this is great. Using Google Docs, I could see real time what they're thinking, if they're off task, on task, they misinterpreted the concept or misunderstood it. I could give them real time feedback. Other sources I gave um, help students gain perspective on political, social, and e economic issues. So this one is about Uruguay. And the question I asked them, help them see if there's balance in their um, research work. So the question was, what did the supporters say? What did the opponents say? And then weigh if that was balanced. Okay. I also asked them, why did the government legalize it in the first place? Okay, so the first task that we did was a reading task. Again, uh, this is actually checking comprehension, understanding, can they extract the information, and can they also prove it by locating or pinpointing where it can be found in the text. Again, I used a Google Doc that I shared. The task-specific clarification link was attached. So then they could just click on it and see what the expectations are. I marked it by um, highlighting in blue all correct answers. So this guy did really well in doing all the tasks that was needed. Extracted information, comprehended 100% the article, and could pinpoint where it was. The second task was a visual interpretation task. They had to now analyze, interpret, empathize on videos. And sometimes it's a little bit um, Say um, controversial, like this one. It's a vice a documentary on medical marijuana, and um, I asked students like, how does a father feel? You know, he has no choice. The child has cancer. He now has a choice between radiation or medical marijuana. How would he feel? You know, choosing between the two. I also used um, making thinking invisible strategies. Like, I used to think medical marijuana was, now I think medical marijuana is, to actually record what they're learning, what they're thinking. Another analysis that we did was on the economic side of why marijuana was legalized. And using the computer seems like open book test, you know, like, that's cheating, but actually it helps students to really use skills they need in real life. For example, I asked them, well, why did it use Gold Rush? The students actually went online, researched what's the historical context of Gold Rush in Colorado. And then they actually connected it and they said, oh, that's why now it's called the Green Rush. You know, so they actually interpreted it really well. My concern now, as a teacher, after all this information, are they now inclined to see taking drugs as cool? And so that was my biggest worry. <clears throat> I went to Rebecca and said, is there an app I could use where students actually input all the arguments for and against, and then they weigh it, and I could see visually, oh, they're leaning on one side. She said, use, a, use tug of war. It's a making the invisible strategy. Students write down all the arguments for and against. And then they color code it according to sources. I also asked Adam, our counselor, to come in 
because I, I wanted him to help me gauge if they are leading on one side. So I'll briefly play video. Memory loss, loss of concentration, Oh, right. Okay. So standard. Yeah, that was definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Which was actually um, cool because they were really relaxed about it and they could share with Adam what they thought. The good thing about this making thinking visible strategy is that you could use it as a display in your classroom after. And students can always refer back to it, you know. And with the with technology, everything's buried online, so you can't see it, you can refer to it. But this is really great. Okay, originally I thought we'll do a debate in class, but that wouldn't actually achieve redefinition. So I went online, looked for inspiration. My favorite one is the New York Times, Room for a Debate. And lo and behold, they announced a student competition. Okay, they wrote down the rules and rule and included the rubric, and exactly what I was teaching in class, they were reinforcing. Okay, okay, we're going to join this. Now I have lower intermediate and high intermediate. The higher group are going, yay! But the ones, the lower ones, like, no way! They fought. The next two weeks became, became a writing workshop. Everything was on Google Doc. They actually collected. They needed to collect a New York Times article on their own and the non-New York Times article. The, the guys who were in lower intermediate also culturally did not work with technology. So they went on Facebook, they played games, finally I said, not technology for you. You're going to write. So these, the rest of the class entered the competition, how it looked like, and the rest of the class who didn't hand wrote. In order to actually reflect on their learning, I asked them to record it on VoiceThread. VoiceThread is really great because I can give them the guiding questions and then they can answer it. Just briefly. What are challenges you face when you use technical or scientific videos for research? How can you overcome some of them? So this is one answer. Uh, some problems that I encountered were that I would have to stop and start the video or play back to access information. A uh, way to overcome this is to read the transcript if it is provided. Okay. So other questions that I asked was like, which one's which? Which type of? Okay. No. Okay. And then um, I think the most interesting for them was, um, is it a sign of weakness to actually change your opinion? Sorry, that must have been it. That oh. was it. Sorry. Didn't recognize the sound. So, yes. Okay. And it could have ended. Yeah. Yes, because it's the last part. So, did I reach your definition? <laughs> Actually, I would say with the New York Times contest, I really achieved it because you can't do it without technology. And the students were really, really engaged because it was a real, real, uh, real life experience, you know, where they, they join a contest and there's a real audience out in the world. If I would do it again, I would give them the choice of an issue they're really passionate about. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. The timer worked perfectly. Do we know who's next? Josie. Josie's next. Josie's not here? Do you want me to use video? Oh, she's uh, got a video? Yeah. Do we yeah. want to do an interspersed video? Yeah. Yes? All right. Clara, do you mind bringing up your computer? That'd be awesome. I want to do you. It'll get hot in here if you close the door. Screen with the 
Shall we take a vote? Who wants the door closed? Yeah, if we if we in a compromise like that or something, because otherwise the light really is very bright. The what? <clears throat> Got it. Good job. Nice problem solving there. Josie is supporting the ultra marathoners on the beach. Oh, nice. For two and a half days. Oh my gosh. Excellent. Okay, so we're not going to worry about the timer because she's got 10 minutes, 30 seconds on there. Are we ready to watch Josie's? Yeah? Okay. Does she have sound there? Hi, and welcome to the Independent Big Classroom. We're a busy class in Tokyo. This is a total course by final project. The Independent Big Classroom project goal was to provide a link between two units of inquiry, how we organise ourselves, and where we are in the time. It is the first time this project has been implemented to explicitly cover new ICT standards within our school resources to redefine both teaching and learning practices in the classroom with technology to be next involved in the first century skills. This project focused on engaging learning activities with learners from multiple cultures through email and other electronic means. The main net standard covered by students provided independent action was communication and collaboration. Students use digital media and environments to communicate and work collaboratively to support individual learning and contribute to the learning of others. Our class goal was to ask many classes the same question and record the data to create a yes-no survey and the possibility of an invitation for future communication. Email was our main communication tool because the students are aware that adults check their email daily and it is generally the replacement for a personal business session or a memo. We had to apply to the tech department to gain access to a class of email as we are a grade one and do not use our personal emails at this level. To help them understand where our emails were going, we used Google Maps. The digital format and the walking view gave us a perspective of the different areas in which the schools were located. We also report this information on a classroom map. Google Docs presentation was used to develop the classroom data display, including maps, email addresses, and question answer charts. Slide share, photo booth, and Excel were also used to collaboratively communicate answers to our contact questions. All shareholders were involved in the beginning, colleagues, parents, and students. I used the standard PowerPoint presentation the follow-up email to introduce the idea, the curriculum covered, and the purpose of the project. I also included a personal invitation of involvement. This was a very beneficial part of the project, as the bias came from international classes to the person in each. I like writing this stuff. <laughs> My question that was do you wear costumes on Halloween because I really like Halloween. My favorite question was do you like reptiles? My question was do you like reptiles? I like reptiles. Our last goal was to ask many classes the same question and record the data create a yes-no survey, and the possibility and invitation for future communication. We contacted 25 schools and received feedback answers from 17. Of those 17, only three engaged in conversation. Slovenia became a very popular country after the students there asked us grade-level questions. Yes, I think that we reached our fast goal. The project allowed students to have an authentic global audience. It allowed the technology to be a tool to enable and enhance communication of our survey. The systematic approach provided by electronic presentation tools created easy to read and interpret graphs 
The posters are from Slovenia and we answered them because we, they answered the ten questions. We felt exciting when we answered the posters. We drew the pictures and took a photo and emailed <laughs> I learned that you can make graphs and send data, and I like making your posters and sending them to other schools. <laughs> How we send the graphs and the posters? Email is some is an important thing to send. You can. You can have email from teachers and from school and from parents. Email is for communicating, for messages, and mailing. We both, we two got mixed up. As we moved into our unit early on in place and time, our map reading skills and prior use of Google Maps have helped us to quickly locate our address and place things on our shared class map. Relaxing Friday shows independent use of skills learned throughout the inquiry. It is with pride that I observe many students going through the maps to show friends' places, students creating their own surveys, and printing out tables of data with graphs. As a result of increased communication with the global classroom, the students are now using a private class blog. This project is a wonderful extension of an early inquiry and front loading for our members. I will be using it in the future. Next time, I will structure the initial email differently to include a place to write participating schools' names. I will have a deeper understanding of the newest version of these maps, as I am sure it will update yet again. It would be good to have a variety of student and class pictures available on Twitter to attach to the map to make it more personal. For those classes that take the time, to ask us questions, I would like to find a variety of live formats for the students to exchange ideas. The Slovenian class is part of a small public school with many different to access. No use of Twitter, and at our class level, very little internet use. As there are many shareholders in the project, it is vital to ensure future participation by providing positive feedback. All schools and parents involved will see the slide share link to the data received. Students of our class share the information with their buddy class using the visual display and digital data. Colleagues will have a small presentation of thanks for involvement, the link to the data, and the link to the student presentation. I will also be available to colleagues during our school professional learning community meetings. The best learning for this course came from the face-to-face -face sessions. These provided an opportunity to see the passion other educators have for technology in the classroom. These sessions also provided time to explore a variety of technical options with hands-on peer support. Not being a digital native, we provided a real network of support to continue with the course. My biggest learning came in course three, the digital media options. I enjoyed exploring and rediscovering different presentation tools with many options for making concept maps. My favourite being Bubble Up and some stop animation using iPad app iMotion. Redefinition is the creation of a new task which was once unimaginable. This is an original project from the Grade 1 classroom. It enables the students to create meaningful real-life links with the world around them. 
from learning skills, students, experience, are now enhancing the following years and creating new learning opportunities to take China. Australia. I feel that this project, supported by other curriculum areas, is a redefinition to our planning and implementation of ICT and public learning skills for future inquiries. Thank you for watching. Any comments or inquiries, please leave a message at www.coetail.com/josiewatts. Thank you. You good? Is that your sound? Sure. Did you plug it into the USB? Are you ready, Trent? Sure. Okay. Love this high tech timer. Okay, go. Okay, so my project is a tale of airplanes and discovery. It's a uh, as a principal, I wanted to work with both kids and adults at in my school, and uh, so as a result, um, you'll see that I worked uh, with a group of sixth graders and seventh graders to uh, work on infusing technology into their science project, uh, their science fair. The old-fashioned science fair board just led me to go, we can do something better with this. And uh, so my, I didn't have a goal to begin with, but my, uh, my goal was going to derive from what the students wanted uh, via their science project. So it was a, a very um, uh, bottom-up process, if you will, um, very organic. 
and I took a risk. I'm usually somebody who takes things and plans step by step by step before I even start something. So for me, this was an opportunity to really do it completely upside down. So, um, so here's how I introduced it. I uh, went to the science teacher, the sixth and seventh grade science teacher, and uh, Tony O'Sullivan, and I said, Tony, I want to infuse technology, but I want to do it in an authentic way for the kids, and I don't want to just play with, because sixth graders will just play with tools, and I didn't want them just to do that. Um, so he said, this is perfect. I was going to introduce how to technology, and I showed him the pedagogy wheel and SAMR model, and he was really excited because he showed that with the, to the kids, and he said, guys, Mr. Citrano has a limited number of kids he can work with, infusing technology into your science fair projects. And he, so we really played off of each other, and he said, so the first ones to go see him with an authentic process can access him. So of course I had, you know, two or three groups running to me and wanting to work, and um, only those who presented uh, a strong enough argument could meet with me. So there were there were two a sixth grade and a seventh grade group that were both working on paper airplanes, and their uh, concept was basically how, if I change the weight of the paper airplane or the mass of the paper airplane, how does it affect the trajectory? This group of sixth graders, uh, Rui, Pierre Louis, and Guy, um, came in all gung ho, and they had they had it all figured out, and they knew nothing about aerodynamics and nothing about paper airplanes, but they thought they knew everything. Um, and so, but they realized that they had to eliminate variables. Um, that was going to be the number one thing for them. They, they knew they couldn't just throw it that, to get an accurate um, distance measurement. And that's how they were measuring trajectory, it was simply distance. Um, and so what we decided to do is do a bunch of research on paper airplanes. We found out that there's so much information on paper airplanes. There are worldwide competitions. There is a National Paper Airplane Museum in the United States, and there are gurus at that museum with a museum curator who we decided we were going to email. And we wanted to do a Google Hangout with the experts. Um, and so we did just that. We emailed them and said, at the, the museum curator, and we said, we want to do a Google Hangout, and we heard nothing back. <laughs> we were so disappointed. It was like two weeks. And uh, so what we did, if you can go to the next slide, is, um, oh, and then they decided, I know, Mr. Centrano, we'll do a robotics launcher. Because so their whole thing was we have to create a launcher. So can you show how successful this launcher is? Looks great. Not so much. <laughs> so technology may not be the best answer is what we found out in a lot of ways. Um, uh, so what, we didn't hear back from any experts. We were really disappointed. They were work, still working on launchers and different ideas. Um, and then we realized that another teacher, a Japanese teacher at our school, has a big is part of the Japanese Aeronautics Association and has lots of connections there. And she, I talked to her and she said, well, let me Facebook a friend of mine. Um, Shoji Komatsu, and I said, okay, that doesn't mean, doesn't mean anything to me. And we said, well, we want to Google Hangout or Skype with him. That would be great. Yeah, he doesn't do either of those. Mm -hmm. um, he said, no, thank you, but I'll come in and I'll spend two hours with your kids. So he is the national air, uh, three-time Japan, all, all Japan champion uh, for paper airplane launching. <laughs> he is also the president of the Japan... Paper Airplane Association. Uh, he came in and uh, all the way in from Tokyo and met with us for two hours. If you can go to the next slide. Oops. I love that. That's just the right click. Just be careful you're clicking the right click. There you go. So um, he came in, showed us how, not only showed us how to um, fold airplanes, um, but he went through, can you look at the next slide? Um, he went through all this preparation and explained uh, all kinds of things in terms of calculation of lift and da 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 talked to them about potential launcher designs and how to eliminate um, uh, issues. They had, kids had emailed him questions in English and Japanese so he could be prepared ahead of time uh, to know what to present. Can you go to the next slide? Um, and boys will be boys. At the end, he showed them how to fold the airplanes, and oh my gosh, um, they had to get it out of their system. <laughs> it 
Anyway, that would have been them throwing, flying around and everything. Which I think kids naturally need to get toys out of their system and tools out of their system. And I think adults do too, and you'll see that later in my presentation. Um, Ken Blackburn actually, who is the guru of paper airplanes, actually ended up emailing us back two weeks later and saying, sorry, I've been really busy. He sent all kinds of data and charts and everything, and the kids used both Komatsu's Komatsu son's information and Blackburn's information to totally revamp how they did their project. They changed over to using gliders. They created new launchers. They decided locations that they were going to use. So Ken uh, Blackburn emailed us with a ton of information, um, and that was a really positive connection that we were able to make, and the kids were able to redefine how they did their um, experiments. Go ahead. So here you see them launching, not entirely successfully. Um, so next slide. Um, but they got better and better, and you can see that they were t taking copious data on their on their iPads. And next slide. The good news is they they both groups were using Google Docs to um, to put in their information. And one day in the hallway, they looked at me, and they, the two groups came together, and they said, "Shouldn't we like share our stuff?" And I'm like, yeah. And so the groups have now shared their stuff. They're using the same gliders. They've adjusted their weights to increase the validation of their data. So that, that's been a really cool thing that they've done. Next slide. Um, so that's the kids' side of things. The adult side of things is um, we had a professional development opportunity, and I wanted to share some of the things that we had learned in here and have our teachers authentically thinking about how they can do uh, use technology um, and how to plan for it from the beginning. So, and I wanted to demonstrate to them that I wanted to take a risk as a learner, and so I had never used Prezi, and I redesigned Prezi, and I needed to go seek out help, and so I demonstrated that to them, that it's that's what I wanted them to do. And they naturally started collaborating right off the bat in, in within my uh, session. So. Um, my goal was to share with them Bloom's taxonomy, SAMR, and TIMS via the pedagogy wheel, and to talk to them about just don't jump out here, start in the center and work your way out. And I led, led them through a very similar process we went through where people were working together to redesign a unit and to get it to redefinition, and they, they, were re they had a lot of different questions, and they were thinking at different levels and helping each other out. The next slide. So as a result, um, our chemist, IB chemistry teacher um, said, I really need my kids to share their thinking with one another. And I, but I don't want to do it, just you know, have them doing presentations. So she um, found out, actually right after my presentation, there was another presentation put on by another teacher um, about iPad apps. And she discovered Erasma. And now she's gone Erasma crazy. She's got auras all over our school um, of kids sharing their thinking. If you haven't ever checked this out, you, it uses augmented reality to place um, a video or animation on top of an inanimate object. So she takes posters with the kids working, and you go up to it with your iPhone, put it on, and it automatically plays a video of the kids explaining their thinking or the process. So um, you can use that for, um, our library is going to start using it for book, re book reviews and that kind of thing. It's a really powerful tool. And she's used that um, in a really nice way to be able to uh, uh, connect learning. And, and everybody has an iPhone, so everybody's really using it now. Uh, next slide. Um, another teacher coordinated with our art teacher, and she's using Book Creator to enhance visual literacy into her classroom in authentic ways. Next slide. Um, these are the student standards that I targeted. Next slide. It's teacher standards. Sorry, I'm going to make this really quick. Um, what did I learn? Jump in with both feet. Um, and uh, don't be afraid to not have all the answers at the beginning. Um, and um, that actually reaching out to experts is easier than you think. Next slide. Um, be open, take risks. That people are really are sponges, kids and adults, and that they're willing to learn. Um, how did I share this with my colleagues? It's on our website at school. I did a news article. I've been blogging about it. Um, I'd like the teachers to share out with the wider audience, with our wider staff, what they're doing so that it continues the path and a more open uh, openness of professional development amongst our staff. The students are going to be sharing their uh, science fair project on their social media as well, um, Facebook or whatever. I do think um, we 
hit some pretty high levels of modification and redefinition via reaching out and collaborating. Um, so some thank yous and a lot of citations for stuff. So thank you. Should we take a break? Yep. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, it's carrot. <laughs> it's carrot muffins with some sort of um, frosting. Yeah. So let's take a break and come back here. Can we take a shortish break and come back here at uh, ten fifty? That be okay? Yeah. We just kind of keep going, crank it through. Are you okay with that, Sankita? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, the buzzing drives me crazy. Down to the canteen. Down to the canteen. Yep. I mean, it's like nine minutes. Six seconds. So just try.